Grammy award-winning artist, activist, and philanthropist, Angelique Kijo exploded onto the international music scene with Logozo in 1991, wearing a provocative zebra-striped cat suit symbolizing Africa. You all remember that. <laughs> the album went to number one on Billboard's world music charts, and since then, she's never looked back. Ms. Kijo has collaborated with Carlos Santana, Branford Marsalis, Alicia Keys, Peter Gabriel Bono, and many, many more. Through her foundation, Batanga, and as a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, she's advocated for a range of causes, including education for girls in Africa. Spirit Rising is her first book. Here this evening in conversation with Angelique Kijo is John Santos, five-time Grammy-nominated percussionist and one of the foremost exponents of Afro-Latin music in the world today. Ladies and gentlemen, Angelique Kijo and John Santos. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here tonight. I can't uh, begin to explain to you what an honor it is for me to be on this stage with, with Angelique. Kijo, Miss Kijo. The honor, honor is mine too. We've been speaking a lot about African rhythm from Cuba and songs and interesting. Well, um, this book is uh, the main reason I think that we're here tonight, this new book. And it's an incredible book. How many of you already have this book? Many of them, okay, good. <laughs> well, this book, uh, I, find, I found it to be an amazing thing. And I want to begin just by thanking you because you've been on an incredible journey that this book does a great mm -hmm. job of giving us a glimpse into what makes Angelique Kijo tick, where she, come in, where she comes <laughs> from, and what uh, has, has built her into, into who you know. I have to say that um, as a father myself, it has touched me on a lot of levels. As a father, as a fan, as a musician, as a person concerned about human rights, on all those levels, this book is profound. And um, I think that it's a memoir that you're gonna enjoy a lot. So I wanna, I wanna ask you a couple of things that are inspired by the book, but also a few things that are not. Mm -hmm. And um, mainly, what struck me about, uh, about this book is just how personal that it is. The journey that you have taken from Benin as a child and, and, and leaving and going back and going around the world many times and representing in such a powerful way women, children, human rights on so many levels. I have nothing but respect and, and, and a lot of appreciation Thank for you. the work that you do. It's so inspiring on, on, on all of these levels. And uh, what I would like to ask you first is about something that uh, goes back to your beginnings, which is about the religious traditions there and how that informs your work. You do um, an amazing job of making the tradition modern. <laughs> and, and I just wanted to ask you to expound a little bit on, on your uh, philosophy around that. Well, uh, one of the things that I enjoy growing up was um, always going back to the traditional musicians when the rhythm comes and the music comes and I cannot understand it. I go, hmm, I'm not getting this one. So I go to my village and start, I mean, as soon as my uncle and auntie saw me coming in, oh, here comes, when, why, how? <laughs> <laughs> what do you have in store? You have one question. I'm like, yeah, 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 right. And I end up asking 10 questions. <laughs> and I'll bring the music, I say, okay, this is a new music that my mom and father and brothers are playing in the house. I get no clue whatsoever. What is this? So they play it, and they will jam on it. They give me the key to understand it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has always been my reference in everything I do. There's no music in this world cannot, that cannot be played in Africa. It doesn't exist. And uh, for me, that's where I start really writing songs when I ask, what is a song anyway? How do you write a song? And uh, one of my uncles said to me, well, a song is a mixture of uh, spirituality, mystery, and beauty. 
And I say, well, that doesn't say nothing to me. <laughs> That's the big. I so thought, how do I write a song if I decide to write a song one day? And uh, my uncle just looked at me and they're just like. <laughs> and he told me that a song is made of three things, the rhythm, the lyrics, and the melody. I say, okay, but which one come first? He said, that is you that decide from your your inspiration. The first thing that comes when you're inspired to do a song, grab it. And that first thing will lead you to the two. And once you finish writing the song, you yourself won't even remember which one is really the core of the song. And then when you realize that you cannot detach those three things, you cannot separate them, you have a song. Mm -hmm. Very interesting uh, that you would say the three things are lyrics, melody, and rhythm. Because if you ask somebody in the Western world, they're going to say melody, harmony, and rhythm. Well, harmony is some is part of melody for me. I mean, uh, when you, I'm singing a song, I'm hearing the melody and the harmony at the same time. I mean, I never, for me, those two things always come together. If I don't hear the harmony, I can't sing it. Because I, don't learn, I didn't learn how to read or write music. I went to the music school to, to learn how to read and write music. And my teacher told me one day, get the hell out of here. <laughs> And I said, why? He said, you know what I'd do if I was in your place? I would kill my mom and dad over your memory. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. So we Westerner, we all read the music and we have no memory at all. You have a killing memory. I mean, you know the whole book, every book that come by within one day, you know the whole thing. And you want to stay here? Get out. I'm like, hooray, I'm out of here. <laughs> I was getting bored like hell. I'm like, no, I'm not in here. You, know, you mentioned something uh, very uh, interesting related here in the book about that uh, in south of Benin, where, where you were born mm. and raised, that there were no harmonic instruments in the traditions. And I found that to be very interesting too. Not, not one. Hmm. The only thing you have is drum. And you have tons of it. From one village to the other is completely different. The language is different. The rhythm is different. And you go, oh. So how, how it's so rich. I mean, rhythmically, the southern part of Benin, and even the center and the northern part, Benin is it's really a rhythmic country because you have different type of rhythm. You have that kind of shaky rhythm, but in different size. You have cowbells, symphony. You have from the little one all the way to the big one. And when they start playing, oh, Lord, help you. Because the ground shake, because they, they just do those and then you have two drummers in the middle of it, and they are surrounded by cowbell. I don't know how they keep the hearing, but me, I'm like, ah. Oh. But you have that, and you have, I mean, I can, you can talk about rhythm for hours here. I mean, in the southern part of where I come from, one of my favorite drums is called Goza. And the body of the drums is actually made in clay. And the top of it, it's just narrow in the middle, round on the bottom, and a little bit round on the top, where you put the skin the cow skin on the top of it, and you don't play with a stick. You play with a, a fun that you, you need. Because if you play with a stick, you break it by, the, by, by uh, playing hard. And on the top, the skin have different tone, right? You play with a flat hand or with a finger in different part of the drum, you have different sound. And I'm, I was, I'm so much in love with that, with that drum, and I brought one to my, my house in France, and I don't wanna move it again because I was so scared gonna break and it's there. Somebody wanna take it to America, the person have to pay for it and bring it here in one piece. I just like, can't do it anymore, I was so scared. But I managed to find a, a group of um, young Beninese uh, percussion players called the Gangwe Brass Band. And the first time we worked together was for the album Jin Jin. And I, when I spoke to them on the phone, I said, whatever you do, if you don't bring the gozen, don't even bother, come. <laughs> they said, don't worry, we have you cover. No. Mm -hmm. So they came and I said, where's the gozen? They say, wait. Where's the gozen? Wait. I'm like, hey. so they start playing something. I'm like, it sounds like gozen, but it's not gozen. What is this? Actually, they study the drum so well that with one, the one drum, they turn into three small pieces of drum to have the, the, the sound possible on it. And what they did was they managed to have the scrap metal from cars, and they put layers of layers of it to have the thickness of a clay and the sound of it. 
I'm like, wow. <laughs> that is African ingenuity for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, one thing that I learned of many looking, uh, reading this book is that the, you made a mention here of the Amazons. And you know the Amazon we know from, the, from Brazil. We know that word. And the, uh, the ancient kingdom of Dahomey, of course, Benin is the center of the ancient kingdom of Dahomey. And I had not realized before that the Amazons come from that place. Uh -huh. And so it's a real part of your history and your Absolutely. folklore. It's not surprising because you come from a long line of incredibly strong women. <laughs> And, and the Amazon, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Amazon. Well, the Amazon has been an army of women that have been put together by Beyonce, which was um, one of the, the greatest kings from Benin, that start fighting the French actually over slavery at one point. And his first, sim his first symbol was a shark, ready to eat, eat anybody that come to his shore to get his people, he was ready to cheer them apart. And he created that army because he believes more in the loyalty of the women than the men in his army. And he has a strategy that defeated the French army many times. The General Dodds, my, that king was his worst nightmare because it doesn't matter what, how hard he tried, he never get, gonna get it. And what they will do, the women, the Amazon, it's a very interesting society. The, the, the descendants of the Amazon are still there today. And some of them sang on the song, the women that have the fabric on the, the chest, that's how they dress. They will sacrifice one breast to be able to shoot. Oh, God. And they won't, re they won't go back. It doesn't matter how much of them you're killing, they walk on you till you, you vanish. And that's how he was powerful alone, enough to kill them, to, to win the battle. So at one point, of course, his brother that wanted to be a king betrayed him. And he knew. And he said before he left, I'm going to change my symbol. And he asked the artist of the, of the kingdom to, to mold a jar in clay with lots of holes. And he put his ten fingers in it. And he said this jar represent the human family. As long as we don't learn to come together, we have nothing that we create that will last forever. Everything we put in, if it's only his 10 figures that are holding the human family, we won't succeed. We all have to come together to realize that wrongdoing to one is wrongdoing to the same ourselves. And he was one of the king that was really, it really impacted um, the memory of people in, in, in my country. Mm -hmm. You mentioned here also about being in school and being shocked to hear at a certain point about slavery and apartheid in South Africa and slavery in general, which you had not heard anything about up to that point. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how old you were at that point, what grade, but can you tell us a little bit well, about that? Well, the first time I ever heard the word slave, I was nine years old. It's, I was watching my brother playing the guitar. My brother was born bored, never had hair till today. So I was seeing him, I was like, me, I'm, I sneak around all the time because I was the last girl, all I had was boys. So I thought I was a boy, right? So I'm not do everything that my brother does. I'm like jumping everywhere. My mom was like, ah. <laughs> So I was looking at my brother, I said, do you need to wear a wig before you play the guitar? <laughs> and he said, no, I want to look like this guy on the album. I said, by the way, this guy is, it looked like African guy. I mean, what language is he singing in? He said, English. I said, that is English? Hmm. I don't speak English, but I know some people that speak English. That's, no, 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 it's not English. Who is he anyway? And he said to me, he's an African-American. Nine years old, I thought I know it all. I look at him and I like, you think I'm stupid? How can you be African and American? There are two different continents. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then he goes, you know what? Don't start your question conquest on me. Go somewhere else, go ask grandma. <laughs> and up I go. And I say, but why? And then I come back home and I say, why do you say he's African-American? What is that? He said, because he's a slave descendant. I said, what is a slave? What is a descendant? I said, and he told me, 
beat it. Go ask grandma. So I went to my grandma and I asked her, and she sat me down, started telling the story of slavery. I'm looking at her like, She said, no, this not can be, I mean, it's not possible. I didn't believe her because my father thinks I could remember, I mean, I could understand meaning of phrases and anything. He was always telling us, a human being is not a matter of color. Do not get stuck on the color of people. It's the same human family. We belong to that, blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, my grandmother is losing it. So then I turned 15, and... Uh, at, at that time, we didn't have, still didn't have TV in Benin. So we, if you, you have a good antenna and you can smuggle to the Nigerian TV, you can have a lot of stuff going on, man. Well, and now, then, you're talking about mid-70s now. Right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. You know what I mean? We'd be smuggling the TV and then suddenly here come Winnie Mandela talking about Nelson Mandela in jail, apartheid. I'm like, I look at my mom and dad wave like, what in the world is going on? You guys been lying to me here. How can that be? And I, I, was, I, was, I lost. My world just crumbled there. Then I went into my room, sat on my bed, and started writing a song. And the song is on the album Aye, and it's called Azanakwe. My first draft was really hateful. I was like, kill all the stuff, white South African. And my father said, no, 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 no. Not under my roof. No violence, no hate, no way. You're an artist. You are the one that built the bridges. You're the one that opened the doors. You never, ever going to write any music that prays hate and violence under this roof. If that's the case, you ain't doing no music. Go back and rewrite it. So I went back and rewrite it, and it becomes a song where we will never be in our history again oppressor and oppressed. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, for, for those of us who, who really, uh, that means a lot to us about, about seeking the truth, about telling the truth as an artist. I think uh, a lot of artists, I, I, I would say most artists, are not um, gonna risk the ability to make more money by taking on those issues. And you being a person that so, has so much energy and uh, moved, very passionate obviously, mm -hmm. about the injustice and about what was going on uh, in many areas, how, uh, how has it been for you to have to, compo to have to keep your composure, be an ambassador, be a person who has to be diplomatic and cannot really come out and, and maybe say what you're really feeling to insult somebody? I'm not diplomatic. I'm telling uh. you right now. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now. Sometimes I go like, I would say something and you, you see my husband go like, <gasps> do you really need to say this? I'm like, yeah. Oh, what did I say? Did I do something wrong? He go, oh, can you shut up sometimes? You have a filter. I'm like, is it true or not true? He goes, yeah, but I'm like, well, then what are you talking about? I mean. I mean, I'm diplomatic if I don't want to hurt people I love. But if you're just lying then and just doing things that are not fair, I can't stand it because that's how I was raised. My mom and dad have always stood for the one that have no voice. I, I saw them doing it every day. Sometimes you come back from school, your mom is not there. He's, she's helping somebody there. My father's gone helping the other one. I'm like, all right. Look at the fridge, you find something to eat, you eat, you go to school. They're not here for you today. They're there for somebody else. That's all. I mean, if you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. And uh, since I was a child, my mom always used to tell me, if you want to be an artist and you're thinking about money, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> and she was right. Because first of all, we are storytellers. We are people that write song to touch people's soul. That's have no money, there's no money involved in that. And if you're not inspired, all you say is just empty shell. So you gotta be able to, to gather the story of other people and you gotta be the mirror of those stories with yourselves to be able to give the story out. And I think that as individual, we don't tell enough of our stories, we need our story to be told, we need our story to be heard, because each one of our story can impact each one's life. The way that you have been, uh, what we call in uh, inquieto, uh, in, in, I, I, the word comes to me first in Spanish, but the, the, uh, being a person who's restless, you, you've accomplished a lot, you've done a lot as an artist, but you've also done a lot in terms of human rights and as an activist, but you always are 
looking to do more and looking to, to add on. You make a mention here of something very interesting, being a representative of, of uh, UNICEF, where you are an ambassador, and you have to be a little more diplomatic, perhaps, than... I know, that's what I love about UNICEF. Yeah. That's why they, they said, that's why you guys are the ambassador. What we can't say, you can say it. Uh. <laughs> And I love that very much, especially when I'm going under the skin of politicians, <laughs> poking them out. They can't do it because they cannot be involved in politics. That's why I'm there for. Uh -huh. Especially when I'm in Africa, I can say stuff they can't say. <laughs> when we go meet the minister and we go meet to this and that and they will tell, I know what is going on, what time is it? I'm like, I'll tell it, just leave it to me. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> I bless your heart. That. I really can. <laughs> Well, I want to go back just for a moment to the women in your life. Uh, your grandmother, you speak about your grandmother here and your mom, who, who your mom is still alive too. Mm -hmm. and, 87, and, still grooving. Uh, <laughs> and um, you mentioned here something about a group, an organization called the Beninese Mothers Association for Women's Rights. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, the thing about women's rights and feminism from the African perspective, how do, you see, how do you see your work around that well, issue? Well, me, when I started doing uh, singing with my mom and her friends group, that were basically asking for women's right to vote, to choose the partners, not to be treated like carpet. Because most of the time, that's, that's basically what they were, they were, they were meant to, to, to be. And uh, I was eight years old, and my mom's friend, we go, Bring your child, she's gonna save the day. We sound like frogs, we can't sing. Bring her, she can sing. So I'm in the front of marching with the women singing. Give the women the right to vote, you can treat the women bad. And I was I don't understand nothing what I was doing. I was just like, I'm having fun right now, man, this is cool. I'm singing and walking the street, everyone's looking at me, hey, yeah, where? And I didn't know I was just being feminist before the, the time, I mean, I just like, well, hey, I like it. I'm loving it very much so. And uh, I, I grew up and started realizing what women go through. I mean, my mom was lucky she married my father because my father was like, I'm not stopping you from doing anything you want to do because I don't want hell on the house. <laughs> <laughs> my father was so funny. My mother said, hey, she's a human being. She's not my thing. She's my partner. She's the mother of my children. If she want to do theater, go right ahead. And then you see people coming, their friends, so-called friends. Frank, what are you doing? Who's wearing the pants in the house? My father said, we both are wearing the pants. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any problem about that? <laughs> if my wife is happy, I'm the most happiest man on the planet. Where should I stop? <laughs> I mean, just like... And that was my father, and my father always said that to us, do not let any man abuse you. Hmm. The man raised a hand on you and said, excuse me, that excuse, you make him eat it, and you walk out of the house. You pack your stuff, you come here. And if you come here, I'm gonna be the one that beat the crap out of him and send him out back. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, woo -hoo. <laughs> <laughs> And said the same to my brothers, don't raise a hand on a woman. You do that, do ne don't, you never come back to this house, I don't wanna see you anymore, I don't know you anymore. Period, that's all it is. Mm. So when you grow up with a father like that, your standard of man is high. Mm. You see what I mean? Yep. Because I ain't taking no nothing but from nobody. You, you're a man, you raise the hand on me, you better be dead before I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm gonna give you hell, yeah. for real. You better kill me first. At least I'm alive, you're dead, for real. My brothers first, we come after you. You see them coming, they're all gonna line up like that. <laughs> Even me, when I was start dating, man, the guys will come home once and never come back again. <laughs> they go, I'll meet you at the movie, man. Your brothers are waiting, all of them like, they're online and your father finished the line, go, who is your father? <laughs> Who is your mother? And then you go, oh my God, what is this one? <laughs> Well, you, uh, you made another reference to this here that I find also very powerful, which is the, the Batonga Group uh, organization that mm -hmm. you formed, in particular to, to train young women how to, how to get an education, how to do certain things and, and have businesses mm -hmm. and be able to be women who could then be better prepared 
to prepare food and, and raise their family and raise men who would be more like your father? Well, <laughs> my, both my mom and dad have been to school, and I think that's what made them the parents that they are. They were very liberal, very um, way ahead of time. And um, my father always used to say, I'm not rich, but the only wealth I can give you is education. Then you can choose what you want to do in your life. You have a job, and you can sustain a lifestyle. And uh, the thing is, I start company as a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador for the Millennium Development Goal for pri Universal Primary Education. So I record what we call PSAs, I mean, public, public service announcement in French, in English, many languages, that I speak from Benin to urge the mother and the father to send the girls to primary education. And I was, I'm still passionate about that. But one woman reminded me somewhere in Africa, and I think in Tanzania, that um, her girls are going to finish primary education and they want to continue. What do we do for there, from there? And she reminded me that if she doesn't continue going to school, she's going to end up in early marriage. And I'm like, oh, oh, all right, let me think about it. So it stays and stopped bugging me. So I came back and said, how am I going to make this happen? So I had a friend that worked for UN, uh, the UN organization, UNDP sometimes, to organize some fundraising and some event at the UN. And I said to him, you're having a discussion. I said, I need to do something, man. I need to do something for my continent. But with the crazy schedule that I have in my career, how am I going to be able to do that? I need to find people that will do this with me. He said, I know your dedication. I will think about it. And something come across, I'll tell you. So a couple of, one or two years after, he came to me and said, there is a couple out of um, uh, Washington. They are lawyers, and they are very interested in working in Africa. They're already working in Africa with uh, a foundation that they have. So we met, and it was love, love as first sight. You, there are some human beings that you meet, and you go, is it possible that this earth has so many good people still? And those kind of people exist. You just cannot lose faith in people. So they come together with me, and we started Batonga Foundation. And the first girls that we took up on were the girls that was in the program of USAID in primary education. They were finishing up, and their USAID said, we'll help you put them to secondary education. So. Batonga is in secondary education in Benin, Mali, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, and Ethiopia. In Sierra Leone, we built a school from scratch. We built a well because we need toilet for the teachers and for the girls. In uh, Benin, we have more girls. In Mali, we, we have been through, um, I would say, two years of pain because my girls are in Kidal, where you have the, uh, the Muslim ex extremists. Kidal today is a huge refugee camp. So I, have, I don't know, I haven't for two years have any news from my 60 girls. So two weeks ago, I hear that they are trying to smuggle in there to get some news from me. Some girls managed to escape, but some stay there. So we want to try to get them out of there and continue taking them to school. And, it's, it's kind of stress, it's a stressful situation for me, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we're gonna find a solution. And then in, in Ethiopia, we have different um, programs. We have one in Addis Ababa, and we have another one in Arbamench, two of them in Arbamench, where we are realizing that the one that is really more effective that we're gonna implement everywhere is the one where we give microcredit to the mother in order for the mother to pay the tuition. We still have for the uniform, the books, and everything else. But you impact the mother, suddenly education means something for her. It's palpable. So the girl is going to stay in school all the way through secondary education and go pro pro probably to university. So I've met a couple of the girls in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, one of them graduated, and she's studying her uh, school of, she wants to be a dentist. And one going to graduate, I have already ten that graduate. Seventh are in private university, and three of them are in public university. And the new one that are going to graduate this year, one of them is saying to me that she wants to be a um, structural engineer. I said, what do you mean by that? She said, I want to re refurbish all the old building 
that are in my country, instead of breaking them down and building all those ugly buildings, I want them to be, because that, this, this, this is our heritage. And also, I want to build dams. I said, why? Say we shortage of water here. We got to do something. She's 16. I'm like, go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> mm. That's what I said. <laughs> Angelique, um, how many languages do you speak? Oh, don't start asking questions you don't want the answer for. <laughs> well, I speak four different languages from Benin. And in Benin, I think we have at least 50 languages. 55 oh. Yep. This is nothing compared to Nigeria. I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh man, the other country they speak like, you don't want to know. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you want 50 over 200 or what do you want? <laughs> pick, your, pick the country you want. Um, and I, of course, I speak French because Benin is a French speaking country. I learned English through my family because part of my family is from Nigeria and I have also family in, in the UK. I have Portuguese, Brazilian blood and English blood from my mother's side. And um, I speak German because I speak, I learned German for five years in school. I don't know why my father forced me to learn. No. <laughs> because he loved German literature. He's like, well, you gotta learn German. I'm like, why my brothers and sisters love Spanish and I have to learn German? You go. I'm like, all right, yeah, whatever. And I, I loved it. And I'm, I'm learning um, Portuguese and Italian by myself. Is there some Portuguese uh, colonial history in Benin? Because Absolutely. I know there's, there's a place called Porto Novo. Absolutely. Absolutely. My mm -hmm. mom, maiden name is Fernando. Uh, my uh, great grandfather from my mom's side was a slave descendant from Salvador de Bahia. There were seven brothers that make it back to Benin, mm -hmm. and they settled in Isenyi, in the kingdom of the Yoruba in Nigeria. Mm. And after that, they married in Benin and they just settled a different part of Benin. Mm. So I have that Portuguese blood from there and um, we used to speak the Creole. So I know a little bit of Portuguese, Portuguese before I went to Brazil. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I have one more question before we open up for some questions from the audience. And uh, you made a, another, another reference here that struck me about people who consider themselves to be uh, traditional purists of, of music. <laughs> and that one, everybody's asking that question. Well, it related, uh, I related to music here, like for example with jazz, there are people who might do the same thing and, and consider themselves to be a jazz purist, you know, that a certain type of jazz is... Are they is pure the first? Eh? To be a purist, you have to be a pure person. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Have you seen any pure person around us here? What is pure? You look in the nature, there's nothing pure. I mean, it's, for me, it's just a lack of education and a fear of losing something that they don't even have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want people to tell me what I have to do. I don't tell anybody what they have to do. Mm -hmm. Some people think that they're more African than I am. I mean, a journalist in France asked me that, say, writing a newspaper, I doubt about her Africanity. Forget you. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> do I care? I don't care. I really don't. I, those are not issues at all. We have many, many more important issues to deal with. If you want to be the purist, be there. If you want to be on the philosophy of Hitler, go there. Leave me out of it. Hmm. Hitler was looking for a pure race, and look at what happened. Hmm. When, when, when are we going to learn and just stop doing stupid stuff like that? No, I won't. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Yeah. I don't text purists, man. Hey, you're pure, go ahead. I got you. I f Are you pure? No, no. That's it. I like it. <laughs> but uh, for me, it was an eye opener. Your reference, specifically here, because it was with African music, some types of music that are played in a village, perhaps mm -hmm. that an outsider would listen to and go, oh "My God, that's some pure African music. It must be centuries old." But you made the point that. This is music that, e the, the traditional music is also modern music because it has to evolve and it has been evolving for many years. Wait, if traditional music is not modern, it won't exist anymore, period. I see it. Because the, my ancestors, centuries ago, they have other reality they were thinking about. Our history in our family have evolved, right? The history of the country where we live has evolved. So why should we African be considered as a piece of museum? We cannot evolve. We can't wear jeans. We can't be modern. Just to fit somebody's fantasy? 
Excuse me? <laughs> Go to the museum, man. Leave me alone. <laughs> man, I don't care. It's your misery. Leave me out of it. <laughs> well, it's uh, that time already for, for us to open up to some questions from the audience. I think uh, you guys are going to pick the questions, They are in right? charge with microphones, yeah. <laughs> so you better go ahead. We're going to ask you if you have a question, and if you're in the middle of a row, to step out to the aisles, because we've got a real full house. Oh, oh hi. Oh, I'm going to start right, right here. Right there. Right here on the side. Uh-uh. <laughs> he said first. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um, so Mandela just passed. Who do you think is Africa's next Mandela? Oh my God. That... <laughs> you... <laughs> but do you know one that you can suggest? <laughs> I'm not seeing any. I mean, the only person that uh, for me, after Nelson Mandela, that is on top there is Desmond Tutu. Yeah. Mm. And so with that, what do you think Africa has to do to raise the next Mandela? Well, we have to take care of our own business. And for that, we need also the Western countries to realize the impact and input in our decisions. Because we don't do any meeting closed door without them being there. Any decision that we can make that will improve our country's economy, that will improve the level of our country's development is snatched away from us because if we developed, the rich country have to pay for it. So therefore, for Africa to have another lesson, Mandela, for us to not to be also always the beneficiary of pity and the rich country have to sit down and take their responsibility and face it. Because if the corporation that make billions of dollars in Africa keep on saying Africa is poor and they don't tell you how much they make yearly there and how much tax they pay in Africa, then we don't move forward. I mean, we have to face it. You telling me I've been diplomatic, I'm not. <laughs> Um, I just want to say I loved your performance at the Fillmore just down the street. It was such a great night. Yay! And I just, I just wondered if you're going to tour with this current CD and, and we can hope to see you with your full band or whatever you're bringing to the next performance. Thank you. Yes, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Be patient. It's coming. <laughs> you guys know I love San Francisco. I cannot tour the world without coming to San Francisco. It's not going to happen. <laughs> It's not gonna happen, and every year I come here more than once, so you guys can't complain. I come here more than I went, I go, I play in New York sometime like that. You live in New York, you don't play here. I'm like, ooh, calm down. <laughs> okay, next question on this side. Uh, thank you very much, first of all. Um, you strike me as somebody who's very progressive, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on what's going on in Africa right now with gay and lesbian populations, particularly um, the criminalization of homosexuality. There's a lot of murder. Um, I mm -hmm. know that a very prominent Kenyan author just came out of the closet, which was a very big deal. Um, I can't pronounce his name. I think his last name is Wainana. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always been the one that being snatched down and yelled at when I'm talking about equal rights for everybody. And it uh, has been my burden since I was a child because I cannot stand injustice. I've had um, homosexual friends growing up in Benin and they always feel welcome and very um, good, happy at home. The problem of homosexuality in, in Africa is it has never been an issue before those religious groups arrived in Africa. And that's when I said no to religion. Because if religion is praising hate of another people, and if you think that you are smarter than God, judging other people's choices of life, you're not a religious person for me. You are a criminal. <laughs> and that's where we all have to come on. If our faith is that strong in God, we should refuse anyone that used God's name to kill or to judge. Because if God has to judge all of us as we judge one another, there'll be none of us here standing on our, on our bull feet. So I said that it's about time that in Africa, we say no to the one that give us money to praise hate. Get them out of there and let people be what they want to be. Leave the gay people, leave their life. Then, I mean, I, 
if they're human being like anybody else. Their choice of life, what is your business in it? I mean, why are you so concerned about it when you're against gay, but there's something wrong about you? Sorry. It's because somehow you have it and you don't want to just discover it. I mean, get out of the closet and live fully your life and let the people live. Me, my philosophy is live and let live. If people are happy, that's all it is for me. I don't care. Somebody gonna, people tell me, oh, it's against nature. I'm like, which nature are you talking about? <laughs> have you been to the nature and see the animals and the plants? That nature you're talking about or your head? Busted head that you're talking about. I mean, it's, come on, we can find excuses, we can describe everything we want. We spend so much energy and so much time judging one another and defining people what they have to do. Defining what the body of a human, woman have to do. Men are there still, I'm talking about the right of, of abortion. I mean, let them get pregnant and see if they can do abortion or not. I mean, why should men decide for us what we have to do with our body? Why? That first is an issue that we have to deal with before we start even taking any other issue out there. Why should we women always have to be the one to be blamed? If story have been told by, ad, by men, what is the count, uh, counting of uh, Eve in this story? So Eve put the, uh, Adam down and snubbed him and go, come on, take this apple and eat it. And Adam said, yes, darling. And he has no responsibility, and we have to take the blame for everything. Sure. <laughs> next, next question right here. Okay, but there's another one here. Oh, okay. In the front here, after. All right. All right. Angelique, when I see you, I see myself as a 10-year-old Nigerian girl <laughs> jamming to your song <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> That's all I can think, and I'm so grateful that I can be in this presence and be able to talk to you. I just, this for me is a dream come true. I feel like tearing up. My question is about your song, Ori, Ori, Ori. Ori, Ori, okay. That's a song that is blended, it has a lot of Yoruba in it. Absolutely. And, um, you talked about your brothers, and my sister told me the folklore that came with that song. Mm -hmm. So tell me how your brothers um, influenced you to write the song, and maybe you can share with them the beautiful folklore that comes with it. Well, why don't you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why should I be the only one telling the story here? Come on. Okay, the, fol the folklore that came with the song, if you know it, it's about a girl. Her name is Olajimo, okay? And um, she's the most beautiful girl in her village. Absolutely. And she had so many suitors coming to her, trying to get, I mean, to marry her. But she would see this man, and she was like, no, this man is not good enough. And it seemed like every man that came to her was not good she's enough. not good enough. So uh, one day, the perfect black man came to her. He's the most perfect African man. And um, she said, yes, this is the one I want to marry. So she goes off with him. She packs all her load, and she goes off with him. So they had to pass several rivers. Mm -hmm. Um, to get to his homeland. And each river that he passed, he would take off an item of his clothing yeah. or his body or something. So, <laughs> so they passed each that. river and he was taking off something. At the end of the river, <laughs> of the seventh river, um, he was left with just only a head. So yeah. she was married with a head. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. So Vanity, yeah. <laughs> he takes her to this watery, I think it was a watery, um, he's from some water. And, He's in there with, with her, so he's stuck with her. She's stuck with him, and she's married to him, and she had babies for him. Every time she tries to run away, the babies, who are just heads, <laughs> will start singing, Ori, 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 I'm looking at you, Ola Jumakello, you're trying to live with that sort of it. And um, every time they sing that song, this man would come back and capture her back. And then one day, a bird came, and so she sent messages to this bird to oh. tell her brothers that she is trapped. And so all her brothers came, and they killed the head, and he, she was saved. <laughs> That's basically the folklore. And she talked about, you talked about your brothers being these people that guided your life. And it is to true. me, I can see the inspiration That's that right. came with the song, and I That's always right. wanted to. And I respect my brothers. I respect men in Africa. And it just. Sometimes there can be a, a pen in the neck. Yes, it can. Right. <laughs> they can, but. Not only in Africa, everywhere. Yes. <laughs> Talk about it. Brothers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's good to have them, though. Yes, I wanted to share that. Okay. <laughs> they are very protective. <laughs> okay. 
Angelique. Angelique on your right, and then we'll do that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm so glad to be here this evening to hear about your stories. Uh, I don't know if you remember performing in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yep. In the Middle East, in the Absolutely. basement, in the early 90s. Absolutely. And that was a great time. And I'm one, my question is, I'm wondering if what you looked for in an audience and what you got out of an audience back then was different from the venues you play now and what you look for and appreciate in an audience today. It's the same thing because uh, for me, an audience is part of the music. It's a part of the show. I never take any public for granted because when you arrive on that stage, as my mom used to say, you have to be ready to be naked spiritually. And when you are in that state, you can touch people's soul, you can get them to tell their story, you can make them feel comfortable, you can make them feel joyful or sad or cry, it's okay. Because at that moment you're in communion with your public and that's what I look for in a small venue, in a medium sized venue, in a big venue. I can tell you right now, I don't like this, the stadium where people are too far away because I like people to be close to me. But if I have a stadium, I'll do the same that I do in a, in a small uh, venue. For me, a public is not an accessory. It's part of the show. And when I'm writing my song, when I'm recording in the studio, I hate studio. I just hate it. Just speaking, singing to a microphone and having the wall in front of me just, ugh. The only thing that makes me go through the process of recording an album is the the excitement of starting the tour and being on stage. To bring it to you guys, go, oof, I give breath to it, now let's, come on, let's whoop it up and make something out of it. That's what I like about it, still. And finally. So I was so happy, well, to see you, as well Thank as you. to hear in this wonderful venue and your remarks about letting Africans decide their own fate without foreign intervention, particularly foreign intervention for money. We're here in this beautiful Jewish center. I'm Jewish, and I belong to Jewish Voice for Peace that feels that the United States should stay out of the Middle East mm -hmm. and let Palestinians and Israelis settle their own problems without our money and our military. I I'd like to know your thoughts. <coughs> Well, my father has always been the one that I quote in this kind of discussion. Because my father was a man that always used his brain and he's always paused in everything. And I remember one day, a friend of a friend brought a friend home and that guy started just blabbing against Jews. And my father said, you know what? You leave now, and you never come back here. That's the type of my father. My father said Every, everything can be discussed in this house at the exception of racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia. And my father always used to say that the problem of Palestine in Israel, if so many people didn't have their mouth in it from the beginning, we won't be where we are today. And I never understood what he was saying at that time because I was too little to understand what was going on between Israel and Palestine. And today it's true that we have, we have messed the situation up so much. It is tangled so much that sometimes I just, my head just spin. How are we gonna find any solution to the conflict? And from my heart, I believe that if we women of this world, these mothers of this world, we come together as coalition for peace, we can solve a lot of things. Because, I mean, we st I'm, I'm ready to go stand in front of the army ready to shoot. You wanna shoot me, go ahead. Because every soldier that you send to war, doesn't matter where you go, is the child of somebody that you send into war. And we have been too silent and too complacent and thinking that our leaders have the solution to the problems. We do have more solutions, we have to bring it on the table. I think that the conflict in the Middle East, anywhere in the world, we so civil society have to have a say and be loud enough about it, especially today with the, uh, the communication tools that we have. Let's weigh in. Please, let's do something. 
We cannot just let people be killed every day without doing nothing about it. We cannot say we feel for you and we know that we can do something to stop it. That's what I believe. To solve the problem of this planet, to solve the problem of the human family, it needs human beings to do that. And we have been too complacent in this country and all around the world, not standing our ground, saying, enough of this nonsense. We want to see this, we want to see this. We have so much power. But we don't know we have the power because we are too afraid to lose what? What do we have? We don't have much. Because if we don't fight for this world in which we are living to be a better world for the children of tomorrow, we will have wasted everything our parents have fought for for us. And that's what we are about to do by our silence and our complacence with our leaders that take decisions for me. I'm tired of them taking decisions when we know that our vote counts. So how do we do that? I don't have the solution. Anyone have the solution, let's work on it. I'm willing to work in that direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I was especially inspired by your stories about education, um, in particular the asking your brother and your grandmother the tens and twenties and hundreds of questions, <laughs> <laughs> and about leaving music school. And so my question is about the schools that you've started, um, because I've uh, the teaching philosophies, um, how those are, because I found that so often the most important education happens outside of schools and that the institutions of schooling can actually really discipline you and stomp down that rebellious spirit that you're displaying and the creativity and all of that. And so I'm wondering in those schooling institutions, how is the teaching philosophy working so that it encourages that rebellion and that creativity and that not just being disciplined into these little boxes? Well, discipline have started home. I, th I think one thing that my parents used to to, to teach us was, my father always said, you have a day, right? When you wake up in the morning, you have the breakfast, you have to be at the breakfast table. We have lunch, you have to be at lunch. We have dinner, you have to be there. What you do in between that time is your business. What you learn during that time is your business. And you experience something we can share together with us, come bring it. So we have always been, the dining table was the forum of speaking about this happened here, this happened here, this happened here. And also the fact that you are, my father teach us to be responsible of our time. You know you have homework, you just, you are in charge of your time and you do whatever you want with it. So when we start, every year we start school, my father will go to the principal of the school and say, I'm sending my kids to learn. I'm not sending them for you to beat the crap out of them because they do that, still do that in Africa. Because if you do that, I sue you. I take you to jail. So my father, he just say that and then walk away. He doesn't do nothing to nobody. But he just makes sure that you understand his point. So he said that to us because he understand that we, all the 10 children that he has, he always, I don't know how he managed to really understand, know us that much because he knows what we are able to do. And he always said to us, do not lose your truth. Whatever you do, whatever the teacher do, whatever the teacher say, if you don't understand it, come home, we'll discuss about it. If there's another way for you to understand it, we'll find the way for you to understand it. Work on your rhythm. And he, and make, he make that available to us that he will give us tutoring in home for us to catch up what we cannot understand at that time in school. So school was, was not hell, but it was hell for me because I was singing and I didn't want to go back. So my father said, okay, this is the deal. You don't get a degree, you ain't gonna sing. So I was stuck there. <laughs> but I, I, the, the thing that was happening in school also was that I understand things too fast and it, everybody was, was slow. So I was a, a new nuisance for the school. So my father would go, okay, let's do it home. And when you go there, don't talk. Don't ask questions because you're gonna get beaten there. <laughs> And sometimes I can't just help it. I just go and ask the question, and I always talk in the classroom. And when I arrive in France for the music, musical school, what I like about the musical school is that we pick and choose which classes we want. And I start singing with no training, because in Africa there's no voice coach, not in my country at least. 
So my mom taught me how to sing. So I start singing without a microphone. Probably that's why my voice is powerful. I don't know. So, and then when I arrived, when, before I left, my father said, whatever you choose to do, if you end up being the human rights lawyer that you want it to be, or a singer, go to school and know your capacities, your limit, how far you can go and what you can do with your talent. So the first two years of musical school for me, I went for something that was completely out of my league. I'm like, I'm gonna learn classical training. My brother said, you wanna do what? I said, I'm doing classical stuff. <laughs> so my vocal coach was actually an Italian lady that was teaching us the, the breathing technique of the classical singer. Sometimes I, I mix so many techniques when I'm singing, I don't even think about it anymore. So two years in that, and of course, once again, my rebellious spirit was always in the middle of everything because we started listening to Ravel one day. And I was like, oh, this is written in an African mode. And someone went, shut up. You, everything is African, everything is African. Ravel is not African. I'm like, I'll show you. One day I'll make my Ravel African, you'll see what's gonna happen to you. <laughs> and I did, you know? That's, that, that's how you, you put your rebellious um, spirit. You don't, don't let anybody crush it. As long as you move forward and thinking about how you can make, make that rebellious spirit impact and empower other people, do it, just do it. And don't stay in school. I, didn't, I never stay in school without being on stage. When I arrived in France, I start working immediately with the band and I start playing because that's where you learn. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Another we green, green woman there next to you. Come on, ask the question. Come on. Okay. Then, there, come on. Okay, good All night, right. good night. Welcome back to San Francisco, Angelique. Thank you. Two quick questions. As I mentioned to you Monday morning, you are absolutely an incredible, ah. <laughs> incredible storyteller. I'd like to ask John Santos, who has read Spirit Rising, what speaks to him most from the book? And then I'd like you to share with us what it is you want people to walk away from with Spirit Rising. Thank you. Thanks. John, your yeah. turn. Well, um, there's so much in that book that is uh, highly inspiring. And just uh, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna focus down to, to one thing, which is the inspiration to continue as an activist, because especially for an artist, because um, we look uh, too often in, in this kind of capitalist system that we have that the, uh, to the artist for entertainment right? only. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a lot of people who will say, well, politics and music don't, don't mix. And on a certain level, you know, I see the logic of that. But um, the, music, the, the music from Latin America, for example, from the Caribbean, also the music from Africa, is born out of the struggles. So it, it's already political. It, it, it's, it's political from the beginning. You cannot separate it from the social conditions. And that is really obvious in the book that that's what has inspired Angelique, uh, seeing the social conditions and seeing injustice and, uh, and seeing the art as a, a responsibility as an artist to address those issues. And it's highly inspirational to read that, that aspect. Well, for me, um, what I want people to walk away with is that tell your story. If you don't write it, tell it to people. Tell it to your children. Tell it to your friends because every story needs to be heard. And people always say, I, I, I sing about politics. No, I don't sing about politics. I sing about what happened in our countries and in the world. And as a writer, from the moment you bring a subject into your inspiration, you engage in the conversation. And as soon as you engage, you are politically engaged. As long as you pay your taxes, doesn't matter what job you do, you have your opinion to express. So for me, even a love song is an engagement of conversation to people. And I study that also in literature, the engagement of the writer and the poets. Because we are the ambassadors of the cultures of our countries. And we, it's not, most of the time, people 
they will think about a country and think about a song before they think about the leader of the country. Or they will think about a book they read or a painting. That's how powerful the art is. So we cannot separate artists with, from politicians because we live, in, we, we live the same reality as the politician because they ask us to vote. Because when we go vote, it's not because you are famous or you're not famous. You vote in period because you're a citizen and you don't pay your tax, you go to jail. Right? So we can talk about politics. Mm -hmm. Be I'm, empowered. I'm going gonna, gonna to take advantage also to add one more thing that it's a love story. It's a love story because it, it really describes when she met uh, Jean, her husband, who was working with her very closely this whole time up to this moment. And, but at the same time, out of the great love for her community and for Africa mm -hmm. that gives birth to everything that she does. So it's a love story on many levels. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I was yeah. lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and our last question for the evening. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm an educator. I've been teaching for 40 something years and I started in Togo. Whoa! And I started dancing. To Get the... out, girlfriend! <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! A la fie. Uh, ah. I, st I started dancing to the music of Bello Bello. No and way! Yes, yes way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, f I actually... Which one? Let come on, let's test that. Let's test I can't remember. That was 40 years ago. Now I listen and dance to the music of Anjali Kijo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I have to say that I've been following you for many, many years. Thank I've you. danced on stage with you. I've taught dance lessons to Tumba. We have an amazing routine to Tumba. Oh. And normally, I've seen you You have to come on stage and teach me that routine. Huh? <laughs> uh, I can't keep up with you anymore. Anyway. <laughs> Not that is but easy to say. Come normally, on. what you do, uh, I love that you use your amazing, far-reaching music as a vehicle for enlightenment, enlightenment about everything. And normally, what you do is you sing, and then in beti between songs, you talk, and you educate, and you enlighten. But tonight's different. Tonight, you're talking and enlightening and engaging us and I can't wait for the music. It's coming right now. <laughs> and with that. <laughs> you are the last person we are waiting for you to finish talking, then we can go <laughs> sing. <laughs> so. Are we ready for some music, everybody? Of course. <laughs> yeah, man. Bring it. Uh-huh. Thank you, John. Thank but you, it's not over. You're going to come and, and play the percussions and everything, right? I'd be honored. Uh, you better do that. With John on the shaker, right? And in, that song has been inspired by discussion that I, I have with young kids from Africa. And um, they're thirst for a different Africa and the determination to become better leaders and that's what the song is talking about in many different ways if you need any leaders any good leaders come to us thank you <laughs> I want it all over so we're in love, oh, I want 
Awa na ele eri awa Ta lo fe so were lo kon o Awa Awa na ele eri awa Awa lo leri egbe mi ni baba. Awa lo leri egbe iwani. Oh, awa lo leri egbe mi ni baba. Awa lo leri egbe iwani baba. Do ba fe pe gugun yo awani. Do ba fe pe orisha o awani. Awa lo leri egbe mi ni baba. Awa lo leri egbe iwani. Awa lo le ye gbe iwo ni baba to ba fe gbe gugun yo awa ni awa ni awa ni to ba fe gbe orisha o awa ni awa ni awa ni awa ni yeah awa lo le ye gbe iwo ni baba Well, John is right in there. So this, this following song is also a new one. And in the, on the album, we have Dr. John playing the piano, but he's going to play the guitar. <laughs> Dr. John is not here. <laughs> and uh, the song, oh, come on, shut up. <laughs> we talk about that later. <laughs> well, this song is about peace. When there's conflict, war, anywhere in the world, especially on my continent, when we come to about, about talking about peace, negotiation about peace, the women that are the first victim of conflict and war with their children are never sitting at the table of negotiation at the UN. They should be part of the solution from now on. <laughs> Kulumbu, 
Thank you so much. We're lucky to have John tonight. At least you can move a little bit. Well, this is going to be the last song we're going to perform tonight. It's a song that I wrote um, way before we start talking about the new millennium, one year actually before 2000. And this song is about blessing. It's about finding what we have in common and celebrate it than celebrating what divides us. For there's only one human family. We all have this planet to live on. Hello. Let's do it. The blessing goes like this. Ashe mama, ashe mama, Afrika. Ashe mama, ashe mama, Afrika. Let me hear you, San Francisco. Okay, come on, you got it. You're being too polite now. So if I want to sing like you, it's like this. Whoa, I'm talking about blessing, celebrating the good time we spent together. You guys are giving me funeral mood. We don't do that like that in Africa. When we get together, we are loud. So we go back again. I want to hear you becoming the African village right here in the Jewish center. <laughs> so I teach you again and we go back to it. Ashe mama, ashe mama, Afrika. Ashe mama, ashe mama, Afrika. Come on, let me hear you. Ashe mama, ashe mama, Afrika. Ashe mama, ashe mama, Afrika. Now you talking. Okay, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. You see, you sound like those African women that sang in this album. As soon as they get the song, you can't stop them. They're just singing it. I'm like, okay, I have it. I have it, but they still continue. It's okay. So wait. I'll give you the top. When I say, let's go, come on, I gotta be the boss somehow. When I say, let's go, don't sit down, eh? Stand up back, eh? All right. So when I say let's go, you sing and you dance at the same time. Deal? Let's go, everybody! 
Signing. Angelique Kidjo. 